bad. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Amen. 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 It's good to be in the house of God to be in the praise and honor and worship that he so justly deserves. Amen. Amen. Let's give the Lord a hand clap. I want to say one thing. Now I know what it takes for you folks to slip. <laughs> Two, two songs from the choir and a Baptist preacher. Oh, that's cool. And then you conservative evangelicals <laughs> slip over into Baptist and a little bit of Pentecost. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, Sister Sandra pointing out to the crowd. <laughs> oh, amen. Yeah. Oh, it's good to worship the Lord. Amen. 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 Um, without much ado, I'd like to introduce our, our guest pastor. Um, he's really not a guest anymore. Amen. I think we should just add him to the staff. <laughs> and he's here a few times a year. Um, good brother in the Lord. <coughs> Dr. Kenlow and his wife are traveling and spending some time with family. So keep them in your prayers and thoughts as uh, they travel. You know, Dr. Kenlow, he doesn't like to fly. Like, like Mr. T, you got to run that from the 18. <laughs> They had to knock him out to put him on the plane. Remember that? Fool to knock him out. Kind of in that case. Um, but as uh, Pastor Payton, he is the uh, senior pastor at uh, First Baptist Church in Malvern. So let's welcome him by saying, preach the word. Preach, preach the word. word. You may be seated. Amen. Pastor Payton. Amen. Oh, you're next. 
Precious songs to the Lord. So thank God for you. Um, I bring you greetings then, therefore, from First Baptist Church of Malvern. For those of them that know that I'm here and the others that are probably mad because I didn't come to church this morning. <laughs> um, I'm just, just thankful again to be here. Um, I, I, um, I'm getting ready to punish y'all. <laughs> um, now, before I preach. <laughs> Somebody said, preach the word, I didn't know you. Right. Um, uh, where is Chris? Where is he? Okay. Chris. Oh, there she is. Hey. Now, I just, I had told her that I had something I was getting ready to do, and uh, I wrote a song, another song. So, I can't do all the embellishments that she and Tim just surprised me. I didn't even know that brother could play like that. But uh, I wrote a song that has to do with this passage that I am preaching today. And uh, first of all, let's read that passage together. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. <clears throat> And yep, you guys sang so many up these songs, I'm not breathing hard here. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, boy. Beginning in verse 1. Therefore, since we have this ministry, as we received mercy, we do not lose heart. But we have renounced the things hidden because of shame, not walking in craftiness or adulterating the word of God, but by the manifestation of truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In whose case the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus as Lord and ourselves as your bondservants for Jesus Christ. For God who said light shall shine out of darkness is the one who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels so that the surpassing greatness of the power will be of God and not from ourselves. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not despairing. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying about in the body, but dying of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. For we who live are constantly being delivered over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So death works in us, but life in you. But having the same spirit of faith according to what is written, I believe, therefore I spoke. We also believe, therefore we also speak. Knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and will present us with you. For all things are for your sakes, so that the grace which is spreading to more and more people may cause the giving of thanks to abound to the glory of God. Amen. Therefore, we do not lose heart. But though our outer man is decaying, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. Amen. For momentary 
light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. Amen. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal. Yes. But the things which are not seen are eternal. Amen. 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 Praise God for his word. Amen. 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 All right, y'all ready? <laughs> All right, I'm going to try to do this. This is a, I want to ask you a quick question. Now, how many of you have, you, you still live in the same house you were born in or you same neighborhood? That's very interesting, okay? That's very interesting. Okay, that's cool. Now, for the rest of you, you're probably like myself. I recently, I say within a year's time or so, went back into the neighborhood where I grew up. And it, I, I literally was shocked because what seemed to be at that time so big and so huge, I mean, literally I could step from the street onto to the grass where I used to live in the house. Everything seemed smaller then. And I looked at it and I, I saw it for what it was and, and I thought, wow, this is so interesting. But then a song came to my heart. I guess it's just the Spirit of God just leading me into my thoughts and what have you. And life is kind of like that because in regard to our spiritual life, it's like everything was smaller then. I didn't see the whole picture like I'm beginning to see it now. And it had to do with this passage where you know, in regard to spiritual maturity and growing in the grace of God, I see the bigger picture now. And that's, the name of this song is called Everything Was Smaller Then. And um, hopefully, I, I've written a lot of songs here recently and I'm trying to work on a, 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 a CD that eventually down the road, just put some get some good musicians together and what have you. But in the meantime, I'm, I'm taking piano lessons, singing in a uh, different choir, just trying to learn and about music. So I pray it just be a blessing for you. Uh, just try to listen, grab the words as much as you can. Uh, I will be shaking, just let you know. Uh, and I, I might make a mistake, I'll just cover it and go back. All right? All right. All right. All right. Amen. Don't laugh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Oh, 
Uh, they claimed that he was not one of the original apostles and so was not qualified to teach. 11, that's in the 11th chapter and the 12th chapter. So the accusers themselves were apparently Jews, according to 11.22, who were ministers of Christ. And who, by means of a clever use of recommendations from other churches, had obtained entrance into the churches or the Pauline churches where Paul had ministered. So, with withstanding and avoiding corruption is the battle that you and I face in our personal lives, but it is also in our church fellowships. Okay. And being in a world that is passing away, it is very, very difficult to find yourself anywhere where there is not corruption. Paul helps us to understand then the ministry, what he calls the ministry of righteousness. Don't miss this, okay? The ministry of righteousness, and he helps us to understand it by comparing it with the ministry of condemnation. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, beginning at verse 9, he says, For if the ministry of condemnation, which was the law, which the law was telling you, only you're a sinner, you're a sinner, you're a sinner. Okay. If that ministry, he says, has glory, it has glory. It, there is a boast in the law. If that ministry has glory, he says, much more does the ministry of righteousness abound yeah. in glory. For indeed, what had glory in this case has no glory because of the glory that surpasses it. For if that which fades away with glory, much more that which remains is in glory. You and I, we have certainly the ministry of reconciliation. But in that ministry of reconciliation, which in reconciliation he talks about later on in chapter 5, but in that ministry of Reconciliation is the ministry of righteousness. The ministry of you as a believer. This is not just for preachers, although Paul here is defending his own ministry. And uh, a lot of times you will find that Paul will start off a subject and kind of digress away from that because he's going into other thoughts that he's got to throw out there to kind of connect the dots. So he starts at the beginning of this thing and says, do not lose heart. And at the end, he says, do not lose heart. But I got to tell you something in the midst of that, in the middle of all of that. And so if I've been given the ministry of righteousness, I am in an unrighteous society. I live in an unrighteous world. I preach a righteous gospel to people who are struggling with righteousness. Amen. And even those of us who have been given the ministry of righteousness, if you are honest about your life, you, like myself, will say, yes, I have struggled with righteousness. And yet, it is your ministry. It is your ministry. Therefore, I want to talk to you first and foremost in verses 1 through 4 as we consider our battle being fought best as we recognize this first important point, and that is what we have as believers and as those who have the ministry of righteousness, what we have renounced. What have you renounced? Let me show you what I'm talking about. Verse 1. He says, therefore, Therefore, since we have this ministry, as we have received mercy. The first thing is that we have renounced, watch this, any special privileges. Amen. Now grab that for a minute, okay? 
Because Paul talks about the glory of the new covenant in chapter 3. If flip back. And he talks about if the ministry of death and letters engraved on stones came with glory. So the so that the sons of Israel could not look intently at the face of Moses because of the glory on his face, fading as it was, how will the ministry of the Spirit fail to be even more, even more with glory? For if the ministry of condemnation has glory, much more does the ministry of righteousness abound in glory. We just read that to you, okay? Again. So, we have renounced any special privileges. What do you mean by that? Well, first of all, here's the deal. He says, since we have this ministry, as we have received mercy. Number one, serving Christ is a high and holy position of God's mercy. Amen. High and holy. Okay? It? it is a position of mercy. Now, of course, we understand that mercy is God not giving you what you really deserve. Okay? And so, therefore... What we need to understand is, is in light of that, none of us deserve to serve. Okay? And you got a lot of these jack legs standing up, claiming themselves to be whatever they claim themselves to be. And I mean, the, 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 the list of what they actually claim themselves to be is so ridiculous. I mean, when 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 Pastor Johnson in in uh, Akron claims himself to be God's broker, and this thing takes off into your blessings come through me. That's craziness. And here here's another problem with it. It's putting myself in Jesus' place. Amen. Okay? It becomes blasphemy. And I don't care. Y'all can go back and tell me. I don't hate him. I hate what he's doing. Okay? Because also, there are friends that I still have that follow up under that. Okay? We have renounced any special privileges. In other words, in my renouncing special privileges, I recognize that this ministry, this ability to be righteous and to, with that righteousness, impact people is a high and holy position of privilege from God. Okay? Secondly, then, watch this. Not only serving Christ is a high and holy position of God's mercy, but suffering for Christ is a high and holy position of God's grace. Okay? You see, grace lets me do and go through what I could never do without Christ. Okay? God is giving me, in grace, what I don't deserve. And in mercy, he's keeping from me what I do deserve. Okay? So it's, it's two sides of a coin. And, and, and the wonderful thing about it is, is that unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, Christian, but to suffer for his sake. Okay? So we have renounced any special privileges. And then secondly, therefore taking on this ministry of righteousness, we have renounced any hidden practices. What do you mean? Verse 2. We have renounced several things here that Paul brings to our attention. First is things hidden because of shame. And the King James Version uses it and said things of dishonesty. Dishonesty. Okay? Now, dishonesty for some of us is an ongoing function. Okay? Because we think in order to deal with our jobs, deal with people on our job, deal with church folk. <laughs> In order to get them where we got to get them, we have to be dishonest. I don't care what you think about this term dishonesty. It is called another term, lying. 
okay? And so therefore, this honesty is a matter of shame here. And this is why the New American Standard uses the things hidden because of shame. It is shameful when we are dishonest about something we have no reason to be dishonest about. A lot of times people develop the patterns of dishonesty just because they've gotten away with it. <laughs> but I think I like what Moses said. Be sure that your sins will find you out. So we have renounced any special privileges. We have also renounced any hidden practices. The hidden uh, the things hidden because of shame, uh, not walking in craftiness. Now, this is a deep word here, okay? Craftiness is the word uh, uh, we can get an understanding of from the Greek uh, cunning, uh, uh, specious or false wisdom, okay? Uh, in other words, I know how to take something and put my spin on it so that you get a little emotional about it, and you, you know? You get worked up about it. You get into it because you just, I put a craft, I said it in a crafty way, or I made it crafty enough for your eyes or your, whatever, however I can emotionally grab you, I can hook you. Okay? Then he also says, and this is very interesting here, or adulterating the word of God. Adulterating the word of God. The King James uses it like this, nor handling the word of God deceitfully. Deceitfully. What do you mean by that? I want to say this. Notice that the definition of corruption is involved in this. And adulterating means simply, this Greek word means to ensnare or to corrupt. Okay? But notice that the definition of corruption now comes in with the discussion of the word of God. Think about that. Okay? What are you trying to tell me, preacher? Simply put, without God's word, grab this thought now, without God's word accurately functioning within the mix of whatever it is, whether it is a so-called spiritual event or any secular event, corruption is inevitable and predictable. When God's word is left out, anything's possible. Okay? So thirdly then, we have also then renounced suppressing truth and transparency. Grab that, okay? Because I know somebody will say, well, I ain't got to show everything I am to everybody. No, you don't. I believe in transparency with discretion. I believe that. I believe that I don't need to tell you everything about me because Kind of like the movie said, you can't handle the truth. <laughs> but I do believe that because I have a ministry of righteousness, there has to be an element of transparency with me so that people can see the changes that God is making in me as I depend upon him and his work. Okay? So what do you mean by that, preacher? Well, notice what he says here. Okay. He says in verse 2, but by the manifestation of the truth. In other words, we have renounced suppressing, we have um, renounced suppressing the truth. I'm not going to hold back truth when I know you need truth because truth is the only way that you can get set free. So I'm not going to suppress it. And therefore, he says here, we basically, we manifest the truth. That's the first thought. Okay? We manifest it. The word manifest means make it visible. We make it known. I, if I say that I am of the truth, if I say that I am a Christian, okay, then being of the truth means that the way I live, the way I walk, the way I talk, all that, without, even if I don't say anything, I ought to impact you by the way I am in the company of other believers. Yes. We manifest truth, number two. We make ourselves commendable to men. Watch this, okay? Commending ourselves to every man's conscience. 
Somebody will say in this, well, I don't care what they think about me. But you have to. You have to care what they think about you. Now, I get it. Because trust me, Paul, in, in, in writing, says that it's a small thing. What you think about me. Okay? Amen. So in, in the light of the fact of them coming at you negatively, Yes, but that doesn't mean that you buy that as though that should be the operandus modi of your whole life or the modus operandi of your whole life. As though you, you just, you know, you, you'll never get to know who I am. Really? You're a Christian. Amen. You have a ministry to let people know who you are. Amen. You're, not, you're not supposed to let your life be hid. It is supposed to shine. And shining means that when people see light who are in darkness, they cannot miss that light. Amen. Because you're shining in the midst of darkness. Now when we get to eternity, there won't be anything but light. Amen. But right now, you are light in a dark place. Amen. Where are you going with this? Paul said in 1 Thessalonians 2, 3 through 5, for our exhortation does not come from error or impurity or by way of deceit, but just as we have been, been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God who examines our hearts. For we never came with flattering speech, as you know, nor with a pretext for greed. Therefore also when we do this, not only do we manifest truth, we make ourselves commendable to men, but we make ourselves pleasing to God. That's the whole purpose of your ministry of righteousness, isn't it? You want to be, you should want to be pleasing to God. God just gonna have to forgive me for this one. No, man. No. Don't even go there. Don't want to let God have to forgive you because God don't have to in the sense of the way you're coming at him with a, a, a pretext where God will deal with you. Just let me help you understand. Just remember Ananias and Sapphira. Okay? The mercy, absolutely, the mercy of God is keeping you and allowing you to make the mistakes of sin that you make and be able to confess them and know that he is able to forgive you of your sin and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. But don't play with God. Because you are asking for it. And how many, how, you see, we don't always grab all of the stories that are out there of people who we don't even know that have played with God and God struck them. Amen. How many people are sick right now, dead right now, because they maybe came to the communion table with some malice in their heart against a brother or sister? How many people are dead or sick in the body of Christ because they, they went and blasphemed God in some kind of way? You cannot presume your sin upon God. You better learn how to confess it and be transparent. In fact, the word confess in and of itself means, God, I agree with you that about what you say about my sin. Amen. Okay? And then thirdly, or fourthly then, we have renounced being silent about the gospel. Amen. Amen. We have renounced being silent about the gospel. What do you mean? In verse 3, and even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In other words, I am not about veiling the truth about salvation. Everybody I see, if I don't tell them, I'm praying for them. And if I tell them and they do, you know, don't want to hear it, I'm still praying for them. I want them to get saved. I want them to come to Christ because I know the joy. I know the peace. I know the hope. I know this thing. And it's wonderful. I've been changed by the power of the living God. I don't veil the truth of salvation. Secondly, I have to understand in light of that, or as a little side note, Paul says, in whose case 
The God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving. In other words, I'm going to tell you the truth about it, but it's up to you because the bottom line is you might be one of those out there that the devil has blinded. Okay? Now, that, Paul's not telling me to operate in the sense of the fact that I ain't going to say nothing to nobody. They all going to hell. Okay? I mean, because uh, literally, you got some people out there like that. And Pastor Kendall and I talk about a brother that uh, we've been at one particular time associated with, and this guy is just, you know, if, if they don't say it the way he says it, uh, if they don't cut it in regard to the conversation about salvation the way he says it, they're false teachers. They're all going to hell. And literally, this guy, it, it's like, what? And, and I mean that in the sense of the fact, I ain't got time. I ain't got time. I'm just telling you, it's they out there. There, there are certain so-called Christians who are so bent on what they say the word of God should be that they can't have an open enough understanding of the whole counsel of God's word. So they take a scripture or they take a passage or they have it in their own mind. This is how it should be. In other words, they come to the word of God with preconceived notions and can't hear what God has to say. Okay. So we don't veil the truth of salvation. Secondly, we present the light of the gospel in the midst of men's darkness. Amen. Okay. So that they might not see the light of the gospel. I, I'm not, I, I know I'm in darkness around me. But I am. Because the light of Christ it dwells within me. So I present the light of the gospel. The gospel is important. The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ is critical. Amen. Thirdly, we present the glory of Christ in the midst of men's arrogance. What do you mean? The glory of Christ is the boast of Christ. It is the boast of who he is. He is the anointed one of God. We run around talking about, I'm, so, I'm anointed, I'm anointed, I'm anointed. What? Yes. You know, and, and I mean that in the sense of, that, yes, I know I'm anointed. But now it's, it's, it's become a, uh, a what, what Brother Pascal used to call Christianese in the church. Okay? Where, you know, oh, that was an anointed song, praise God. <laughs> that was an anointed preaching brother that was an anointed word from heaven let me tell you something i am anointed Amen. now if what you mean by that is is that either i did that in the flesh or i did that depending upon the spirit i can't halfway tell because you're so caught up in the fact of using the word anointed you don't even know what you're talking about Amen. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> this thing <laughs> number four then in light of this we have renounced being silent about the gospel. We present Christ as God, please don't miss this, in the midst of men's godlessness. Even people who claim to have God don't know God. And I, I, I got a guy at my job who's a Muslim. And he, he began to talk to me, he said, you know, you know, so matter-of-factly about God. And I, I, I'm right in the bottom of my lip because I, uh, I wanted to lay into it and say, you don't know God. You think you know God. But if I start talking to you about who God really is in the person of his son, the first thing you'll come out of your will let come out of your mouth is God don't need a son. Yes, he does, because you need to understand that this ain't about no doggone religion. This is about a relationship that you need to have with the living God. But I calm down. <laughs> and I'm praying for me. And I'm waiting for an opportunity. An opportunity when I got my head on straight <laughs> and don't go off on the cat and be able to present the love of Christ and show him love Amen. along the way. Yes. So that when the opportunity avails itself, he might hear me. Yes. What are you saying? Number one, we have renounced any special privileges, any hidden practices, Suppressing truth and transparency and being silent about the gospel. Number two, 
verses 5 through 10. This thing of battling corruption is about what we are preaching. What we are preaching. First of all, in verses 5 through 6, we preach Jesus as Lord. Amen. And what I mean by that is he is ruler over all. Amen. You can't get corrupt if this is upheld in everything you do. In other words, if Jesus is first, your life's going to be better. It just will be. Amen. Okay? No two ways about it. If Jesus is kept in the forefront of everything that you think about, in all of your plans, in all of your doing, in all of your interactions with people, if Christ is first and foremost, you are always going to come out with an advantage. Yes. And when it doesn't seem like it's an advantage for you, just remember all things work together for good. To them that love God and that are called according to his purposes, not your purpose. So we preach Jesus as Lord. In other words, let me help you with understand this. Paul said in verse 5, for we do not preach ourselves but Christ Jesus as Lord. What do the corrupt do? They preach themselves. You listen to any of these Jack legs out here who are on television, YouTube, social media in any kind of way, and they are first all about themselves. Not all of them, but most of them. And definitely the so these so-called prosperity preachers. They are all about themselves. <clears throat> and therefore, one of them the other day. His name is Leroy Thompson. How many of y'all heard of this cat before? Good. <laughs> Fonzie's the only one. You thought I didn't see that. <laughs> but this cat is nuts. This is, this is a guy who's got a $16,000 dog. I'm going to let that sink in for a minute. Hey. $16,000 dog, y'all. My, my children. Everybody know my children. My, everybody know my children. My children. My son. He got Lexus. Everybody know my children. My daughter. She got Mercedes. Everybody know my children. And they know my children because of the money. Yeah, he said it. This is what this is how he came from. Okay. Boasting about his money, boasting about his possessions, and saying that you have to have money. He said, we can talk about healing all, of the, all day. A whole nother mess. But you got to have money. Money. And the person that put this, that posted this thing on Facebook, He's posted it in a way and said, what? You mean to tell me this is more important than salvation? This is more important than the gospel? This is more important? Yeah, to them it is. And to everybody that whenever he makes a crazy statement that he makes, they're just screaming and howling and foaming and spitting and throwing wigs and purses and just, just gone. Gone. Why? Because the corrupt serve themselves. <laughs> Not only that, the corrupt go deeper into their darkness. Watch this. For God who said light shall shine out of darkness is the one who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of of Christ. In other words, when when I am when I am proclaiming corruption. In other words, I, the word of God is just there. I use it just to make you make see me as spiritual. I want you to see me as spiritual. I don't really want to be spiritual because what I'm really after is money and possessions and whatever else goes with that filth. That's why Paul. That's why Paul called it filthy lucre. It's filthy lucre because so many filthy things get associated with the, the, uh, the pursuit of mammon over God. Where are you going with this? 
Verse 7 through 10. Therefore, we preach powerfully from our humiliation. Please don't miss that. We preach powerfully from our humiliation. What do you mean? Verse 7. But we have this treasure. What treasure? The treasure of the ministry of righteousness. It is a treasure that you can be right and that that rightness can change somebody else's life. When you say, no, I will not participate in your corruption, you may be hated, but now you have set a standard out there that they must deal with where, however they choose to deal with Therefore, watch this. Your light is now shining, and the person who is in corruption, who hates your light, goes deeper into their own darkness. They go deeper. This is why Paul, in regard to 1 Corinthians 14, told those believers in regard to tongues, do not mature in evil. Do not mature in evil. Can you imagine somebody mature in evil? I mean, come on now. We're talking about, we're talking about the very other end of being mature in Christ. Here's this person now who's dangerous, man. I mean, I, I don't know if you've ever seen a really deeply evil person. He probably said, oh, yeah, I am. I know somebody. <laughs> I, I, I remember going to a jail, and I was told about this particular guy, and, and the guy, I remember shaking his hand, and there was such an... I, 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 this just may be, may be my own judgment, but this is what I saw. But I saw an emptiness in this guy that was so, and this guy was a murderer, or had been a murderer, whatever, however you want to say it. And here he was, and there was such a, just a, a, a denseness that it was almost like looking into this guy's soul. And I just, I, I began to pray because it was so, it was so, I can't even hardly describe it. It was so evil. It was such an impact. But God doesn't want us to mature in evil. In other words, we preach from our humiliation. The reason I'm standing here preaching is because I have had incidences in my life that allow me to, to experience the word of God. Now, let me show you what he's talking about. Verse 8, we are afflicted. In other words, we are humiliated through our afflictions. We are afflicted in every way. In other words, trouble has come in my life, but it has not crushed me because God has his hand on me. And what he means by the word crushed is that I have been so distressed that I lose sight of who I am. I still am God's child. I still am God's servant. I'm going to make it in spite of. Amen? Amen? Secondly, then, is that we are humiliated through our perplexities. What do you mean by being perplexed? In other words, to think that I am without resource. I am so perplexed about this situation. I, I think like I, I can't get through this. I, I think that there's no way to get through this. And Paul is saying that he has been through that as an apostle but not despairing. What do you mean not despairing? The word despairing means to be utterly at loss. I mean, this particular situation may be difficult, and I'm perplexed about it, but I know how to fall on my knees and pray. Yeah. And I know that prayer is the answer, and I just need to wait on God. Because yeah. he's shown me that he'll make a way out of no way. I already know that. Okay? Thirdly, we are humiliated through our persecutions. Okay? What do you mean by persecution, preacher? I mean that somebody has done something deliberately, directly to you because you are a Christian. Amen. Because you are a Christian. Whether it was behind your back or in your face. And Paul says, listen, that has happened to me a whole bunch of times. But I know that no matter what, no matter how they treat me, I am not forsaken. Amen. 
not forsaken? What do you mean, Paul? In other words, I'm not abandoned. I'm not going to be deserted. I'm not going to be left helpless. I may go through a period of time. I mean, I don't know about y'all, but I've been through some wilderness experiences where all of a sudden I'm thinking, where, where are you at, God? Lord, come on. No, you need to stay in the wilderness a little bit more there, cowboy. Okay. Bottom line is, God has something to teach you if you are going through a hard time. Amen. Bottom line, just learn the lesson. Want to learn the lesson, amen? amen. Lastly, verse 9, then, we are humiliated through our seeming defeats. He says, struck down, but not destroyed. We are humiliated through our identifying with the sufferings of Christ. Verse 10, always carrying about in the body the dying of Jesus. In other words, being as a Christian, if you go deeper into fighting corruption, you might find yourself at a point like many Christians that are in missionary fields across the world right now about to be killed. Wow. About to be killed. Why? Why? We are showing Jesus' life through our bodies. Okay? So that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our bodies. So we preach Jesus as Lord and we preach powerfully from our humiliation. Our battle then against corruption is best fought as we recognize what we have renounced, what we are preaching. Number three, verse 11 through 15, what we are living for. What we are living for. Verses 11 through 12 tell us that we are living to show men, watch this, how to suffer. We are living to show men how to suffer. <laughs> no, preacher, you got that all wrong. Okay, we ain't supposed to suffer. I literally have heard people say we are not supposed to suffer. And that is their doctrine. That is what they literally believe. We are not supposed to suffer. Really? How can you conclude that? After all of what Christ did for you? How can you conclude that? We're living to show men how to suffer. In other words, we show them that we put our lives on the line for the truth. That's the first thing. We put our lives on the line for the truth. In other words, we are not the kind that practice bus throwing. What do you mean bus throwing? Throwing folks under the bus. Okay? When another Christian stands up for the truth, well, you by yourself, cuz. Really? You when somebody stands up for the truth of the word of God, they're really standing up based on the scriptures. And all of a sudden, you disappear? Why is that? Because I ain't getting into all of that. It don't take all of that. It does take that. And it takes it from you. You say, well, that's just the preacher. The preacher's supposed to stand. No, you are supposed to stand. The preacher is teaching you how to stand. The preacher is equipping you to do the work of God and the will of God in the community. The preacher's teaching you. What we paying you for? To teach you. <laughs> I mean, golly, come on. Where is it that they, I mean, really, believe it or not, that's the mindset of many of our churches where the preacher, and he, for some crazy reason, he takes that foolishness upon himself that he's the, the, everything's about him and centered around him. Listen, if there's anything that we have to find as our centerpieces, it's Jesus Christ. So we show them what, that we put our lives on the line for truth. For we who live are constantly being delivered over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifest in our mortal flesh. That word delivered over is a, a very wonderful Greek word that goes throughout the Gospels, showing Jesus being delivered over to every entity of humankind, Jew and Gentile, for your sake and for mine, so that in Isaiah 53, it says that he suffered for all men. 
He took on everybody's sin on the cross. Amen. Are you delivered over for Jesus' sake? Are you set up for the suffering? Are you willing to go through the suffering that it will take for you to reach your neighbor who needs to know Christ? I want my neighbor to know Christ. I don't want to be so involved in him that, he, you know, uh, that bad company corrupts my morals. But at the same time, I want to be able to be strong enough to make an impact of love on that neighbor so that that neighbor will come to Christ. Yes. You say, well, i got to move out this neighborhood. I can't be staying here no more. No! That's what God put you there. Amen. You're the believer that God put there. You're the Christian that God put there. Amen. Let God tell you when to leave. He ain't going to tell me when to leave. I got a job somewhere else I got to go get. Okay? You need to pray. Amen. And you need to let God lead you. In other words, watch this. We show them also that we put our lives on the line for them. That's really what this is about. It is the epitome of love. So death works in us, but life in you. I'll go through whatever it takes to go through so that I can just reach you. You're that important. And, and more so to Christ than to you to me. Because my flesh gets in the way of me loving you like I should. But I rebound because of the love of Christ in me. Yes. Secondly, we are not only uh, living to show men how to die, but we are living to speak our faith boldly to men. That's what you're doing. See, if you want to deal with corruption, you got to be bold. Corruption takes boldness. I, I don't care. If you're going to stand up to it, you can't go up against no corruption like wimpy. Okay? You better get your spinach on and get your Popeye on and get ready because corruption is going to come at you with all its force against you to shut you down. And you got to be ready to stand up and be bold about your faith. What do you mean by that? Verse 13, but having the same spirit of faith. What are you trying to tell me? I'm telling you that your believing is about speaking. You cannot say that I believe God and not say nothing about God. You can't say I believe God and not say anything about Jesus Christ. My believing is speaking about my believing. Yes, yes. And I'll tell you something else too. Verse 14, my believing is knowing. Okay? It blows people's mind when we tell them this is what God said and I believe it and I know for a fact that, that it's true. How do you know that? Because I've seen what God can do. And I'm here to tell you that just like John who testified that we have seen the eternal life, I'm telling you I've seen him, I know what he can do, and I'm a living witness that he can change your life. We are living to speak our faith boldly to men. Believing is speaking, believing is knowing. Thirdly, we are living to bring thanksgivings unto God. We're not living for ourselves. And I keep, I know this is repetitive, but notice what Paul is doing. In this discussion, you're getting these same redundant statements because he's defending himself. And when you defend yourself against somebody, it's because the other person keeps throwing these ridiculous accusations at you and you're telling them, no, that's not the case. I am this way. No, you're not. This is what you are. And then you, instead of saying, no, it's about Christ, you probably say, your mama. Something like that. Okay. You know you're wrong. We live for others, amen? amen? For all things are for your sakes. Amen. I preach the word of God at First Baptist because I want to see the members yes. and the community of First of, of, of Malvern changed amen. by the power of the living Christ. I want to see them changed. I want to see them have the joy that I have in Christ. Yeah, we live for others. And we also live for others to glorify our God. I want people, you guys are just singing about it. I want people to praise my God. I, I love it when I'm amongst Christians who know how to praise Him according to the truth. So, in summary, we are living to show men how to die, 
to speak our faith in Christ to men and to bring thanksgiving unto God. Our battle, lastly, then, is against corruption in that we have renounced what we have renounced, what we are preaching, what we are living for, and lastly, what we are waiting for. <laughs> what do you mean? Verse 16 through 18. First of all, we are waiting patiently for our ultimate change to come. Amen. Amen. I'm waiting for my ultimate change to come. I'm changing. I can tell you today that that song was about a little boy who didn't have the whole picture, who's getting the picture now. I see the bigger picture now, but there's more in the picture that I still have not seen. In other words, I'm still teachable enough from God to show me of what he's going to show me. What are you trying to tell me? The corrupt are patient only to an end of wickedness. That's what their patience is about. Whatever they might call a matter of patience is because they've got a, 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 a plot and a scheme to get what they're trying to get. Or to overcome some particular uh, problem. They see you as a problem because you are challenging their authority. Okay? What are you trying to tell me, preacher? We are enduring in the process. Therefore, we do not lose heart. There he is again. He started at the beginning, brings it back. We do not lose heart. What do you mean you don't lose heart? In other words, I don't care how bad this thing gets. I don't care. I mean, listen, I know I, 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 there's nothing more beautiful than the death of a Christian who, who knows how to call on the name of the Lord and knows how to get themselves prepared to go into the presence of the Lord. So no matter if a Christian can do that on their deathbed and get ready to meet their Savior, then nothing in this life is so bad that you cannot get your focus back on the Son of the living God and go through that thing. We endure through the process. I'll tell you something else. If you endure through the process, you will be renewed through the process. What do you mean, verse 16? But through our, but though our outer man is decaying, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. That body that you had that was young. <laughs> That ain't so young now. That when y'all, you young people that uh, you know, you, you might not know about this, but like the old folks used to say, what do they think? Just keep on living. Yeah. When you gotta get out the bed, when you, you you're putting your hands on the bed so you can push yourself up. Yeah. And then when you put your feet on the floor, your feet, not your feet, your feet. <laughs> they hurt. <laughs> Come on now, okay? Okay? The other man is decaying. Okay? You used to have hair. Y'all pray for me. <laughs> you used to have all this glory about you. But you learn over a period of time it ain't about you. <laughs> the more you let it not be about you and more about Jesus Christ, you find yourself being renewed through the process. We move through the process. So we are waiting patiently for our ultimate change to come. And we are in verse 17 are waiting for an eternal weight of glory. Okay? For a momentary light affliction. Now all that stuff that Paul was just talking about what he went through in regard to perplexities and, 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 and being not being crushed and all those painful things and sorrow. He calls all that light affliction. How can you call this light? And this is how we do it. Come on. Okay. If I said to you when you were going through something horrible, this is only a momentary light affliction. You might try to swing at me. Okay. Okay. Why? You don't understand what I'm going to do. You don't know how bad this is. Teacher, teacher. You don't know the things I've seen, and you don't know how them no good for you know, have treated me. What are you trying to tell me, preacher? I'm trying to tell you that ain't nothing but a momentary light of 
affliction. It's light. Why? Because there is a glory coming that far outweighs what you're going through now. You've got something coming for you that when the when the song says when we've been there ten thousand years, but shining as the sun, there's no less days to sing His praise than when we first begun. Really? <laughs> Lastly, then, we are waiting for eternity to become, watch this, we are waiting for eternity to become the permanent reality. Verse 18, while we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. You see, corruption is controlled by this temporal reality of futility. That's why God put futility into what is now the curse. So that everything that men think they can get out of life ends up in futility. Why? Because God is the only one that is going to get the glory out of what he alone has created. And so everything else will pass away. Everything else is futile. If you want satisfaction, if you want fulfillment, if you want hope, if you want peace, you've got to come to Jesus. And then you must understand that once you come to him, now that I'm in Christ, I must impact people with a right way of living. It's easy to do wrong. It's easy to be sinful. Babies come into the world and at two years old, we call them terrible twos. Why? Because they're terrible little sinners. But guess what? I know a whole bunch of 20-year-olds, 30-year-olds, 40-year-olds, 60-year-olds, 80-year-olds that are still just like terrible twos. Why? Because they refuse to recognize that you can't come to Christ until you first deal with the fact that you are a sinner, Amen. lost, and on your way to hell. Yeah. What are you trying to tell me, preacher? Well, I'm done at this. Statistics say simply that what are you willing to do for a million dollars? Two-thirds of Americans polled would agree to at least one of these, some to several of the following. That for $10 million, okay, they would abandon their entire family. 25% said that. For $10 million, okay. They would abandon their church. In fact, watch how nasty this gets. They would become prostitutes for a week or more. Would give up their American citizenships. Would leave their spouses. Would... Somebody say something? Okay. Would... <laughs> Just that one. Would... Would withhold testimony and let a murderer go free. Would kill a stranger. And would put their children up for adoption. We are shocked to hear that. That has been an ongoing thing in third world countries. And it is becoming the same kind of practice here in America. What will it take? Let me ask you, what will it take to make you follow after corruption? Even worse, what does it take to make you stay there? Will you bow your heads with me? Eternal God, oh God, forgive me for the corruption that I have ever found myself entertaining or participating in. And Lord God, therefore, right now, there is somebody in this room that is in need of recognizing 
that their rebellion against you is an act of corruption that comes from their own sinful nature. Therefore, Lord God, I'm praying for anyone that's under the sound of my voice that is lost right now, that they might be saved. If you are in this room today, you must admit that you are a sinner if you've never done that. And you can do it right now to God in prayer because he wants to save you. He wants to give you the hope that I preached about. you're here today and you've never received Christ as your Savior, you need to simply pray right now because God will hear you and he will save you. Ask him to save you. Admit first and foremost that you are lost and that only Jesus can save you and that he did provide for that salvation for you by dying on Calvary's cross and rising again the third day. If you ask him, he'll save you. If you pray that prayer, we want to know about it. And then what you need to do is join a Bible teaching church, and you're right in one right now. And that, I want you to understand, is a very precious, precious thing, and is soon becoming a thing of the past because many churches are falling by the wayside. But this church here is proclaiming the word of God by a godly preacher. And you can grow here. These precious people are standing here for you so that you might receive Christ as your Savior. If you prayed that prayer, we want to know about it. Pastor Smith. Pastor, you uh, remain with your heads bowed and 